Okay. Welcome. Okay, so let, uh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to do a welcome, like an official welcome thingy? I want an intro song. Cool. <laughs> You've got to do it. <laughs> do you want an introduction? I want an intro song. Intro song. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I need to find that. You know, I, I don't have anything at hand now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can sort out for next week. <laughs> cool. So... Welcome everyone. Uh, do you have, did you get the links to the cases? I haven't, unfortunately. I think Nat probably got them, but I didn't get them. Okay. Then we need to figure out why is that you didn't get it. Because the idea, I think it would be great if I can send the links the day before. So if you want, you don't need to, but if you want, you can open the cases before and you can have some time to go through them rather than just having two minutes to look at the case before discussing. Jane, Any, do you want to text me your own email address and I'll just add you to the list? Yep, no worries, I'll do that. Okay, perfect. Cool. And then if you can open the chat, I just kind of copy the link to the case that we are going to go through now. So hopefully you can get that. Yep. Cool. So, Anna, do you want to tell us about this case? Just sure. a brief history. Yeah, absolutely, actually. Um, so Mindy is a six-week-old, um, uh, actually male, entire Tonkinese um, who was bred by the owners and was one of two kittens of the litter, both similar size and um, uh, weight and things up until Friday of last week, at which point Mindy developed, went under the stairs and developed sudden onset coughing and dyspnea which was rapidly progressive over three days. She was actually seen at a Lambie on Saturday um, initially and prescribed some um, amoxiclav and then presented to her NEVS on Sunday evening with the respiratory rate pattern and character having progressed really profoundly over the like 36 hours beforehand. Um, and had these radiographs performed conscious, so there is only two views, and she was markedly, he was markedly distressed, um, really gasping and cyanotic at the time, so we didn't want to stress him at all or minimally. Um, awesome. That's all you need, probably. Oh, well, we may come back. We may need more in the future. So if you all have the cases, open, open the images and take a look, and then I suggest I'll probably can guide you through the process, asking you questions, make sense? So, but probably take one minute to take a look and make up your mind, you know, trying to explain what's going on. So this is less than a minute, I, I, <laughs> but I, I will already start asking you. So, but I, we'll go like easy. So the first question, which he looks, and it's gonna sound pretty silly, and it sounds most of the time a pretty silly question, but sometimes it's a very hard question. That's why you need to force yourself to ask yourself that question, is, is it normal or abnormal? You know, can you, can you pinpoint something that is abnormal? Y yes or no? Mm, abnormal. 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 Well, see, it looks like a silly question, but I would say, some of the most difficult cases are cases where you can go further than that first question. Is this normal or abnormal? And in that discussion, many variations of normal, age changes. All those things are gonna start, they're gonna make you think, is this normal or is this something like it's an incidental finding? And sometimes just going further that first question is very hard. In this case, probably the difficulty is not so much in identifying that something is abnormal, but in trying to characterize it. So let's go one more step. And, and as I usually mentioned, like, is it too white, too black? What, like, can you give a very brief or, or rough um, comment about what do you think is abnormal? Too, too white in the right too middle white. one Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you went, you went like further because you also localized that. So it's too wide, so there is either more cells, more fluid. And I probably, 
and this is not to correct, but probably in order to follow a, a reasonable discussion, I will probably go in the right hemithorax. I would I will leave it there because I, I'm I'm not sure. Then we need to justify why you believe it's in the in the right middle lung lobe. There may be other options. So is there is too much uh, white, so it could be fluids or cells or something, and it's in the right uh, hemithorax. Then probably we any other changes. There's mm -hmm. lots of varietal detail in the abdomen. Oh, good point. Good point. So I I start taking notes of your findings, and then then we when we wrap up the case, we will need to start explaining all of them. Make sense? So one is that. <clears throat> We are going to go through more detail about that, but probably we can say this is an abnormal uh, right hemithorax, and then there is lots of serosal detail in the abdomen. Okay, anything else? Well, there's, there's, there's lots. I mean, the, the trachea is massively elevated. I love that comment, yes. And so, uh, I think it's a, the lateral is an expiratory film, I think, which might make the um, a little hard to interpret, but there does seem to me to be a little bit of a nodular pattern in the caudal, caudodorsal area, um, just above the vena cava. Do you, do you know where to find the annotations tool? Uh, because, can you see my, my... Yes. Okay, do you, is this what you are talking about? A little bit cranial to there. Here. There, yeah. Okay. And, and there, and yeah, but it could also just be, um, um, it is an expiratory film, I think, so it, it makes it probably a little hard to interpret. But there's there's four nodules, sort of uh, cranial and uh, craniodorsal, to that. Four little nodules. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, that's five up that one. Very good. I. I take note of that, so nodules. Yeah, and cool. uh, on the VD, uh, well, there's, there's consolidation not only the right, but the left as well. Um, so there's very little functioning, functioning lung left. So can you identify which, are you talking about the whole left I lung mean, or I, any lung lobe in particular? Okay, um, it's not the whole left lung, it's, my anatomy is slipping here, but uh, yeah, it's certainly, it, I'd call it a caudal lobe at least, but um, uh, it, um, yeah, look, I, it, it's really hard to tell. It could be, well, that's, that's I mean, there's an air bronchogram in the middle of it. So yes, it is a long line. And now you are talking about this? Yes. Okay, good. We leave it there and then we'll come back. So we, I'm gonna call it air bronchogram. Okay, any other findings? It looks like there's a mild pleural effusion in the right cranial mm. chest. Okay, uh, can you tell me, I, I think I agree with you, but can you tell me which is a radiographic feature? Makes sense, which is a, sure. the abnormality in terms of what you see that is making you think that there is a fusion? Um, there's a white area in the right cranial thorax and um, it looks like the lung lobe doesn't go all the way to the edge of the rib. Very good. Uh, so now we are talking about this in, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this lung lobe, this is a border of the lung and then this is a border of the lung. So we, and this is a border of the lung. So we want it to be, look like this, when it goes all the way to the wall, this one seems to be separated. I mm -hmm. like that. So then, we can call it pleural effusion. And do you want to characterize that pleural effusion a bit more? Like anytime we talk about the pleura, we try to say if it's unilateral, bilateral, if it's evenly distributed or not. So can you can you um, add that? Say like localized unilateral. Okay, I like that. So it's at least unilateral. Okay. And the cardiac silhouette looks like it's shifted to the left hemithorax on the VD. Very, very good. So the cardiac silhouette is deviated. Okay, anything else? 
It looks like it's a juvenile. It's got lots of growth plates. Very good. Okay. Anything else? That right area um, of opacity looks like it's um, kind of coming from the wall more than... Okay, now we are going trying to explain, which is exactly what we are going to do next. I'm going to point out one more finding, and I, I don't know if it's relevant, but my eyes went there like as soon as I saw the case. It's pro we are going to then analyze that. Uh, these two vessels, I think this is the pulmonary artery to the left called lung lobe, and this is the pulmonary vein. They look huge, and they look larger compared to the opposite ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't know what to make about them, but it, it just, it traps my eye. You know, every time I look at this radiograph, I can see those huge vessels. So I don't know where we are going to end up with them, but I can't uh, avoid that. So large, actually arteries and veins, at least those. Okay. Um... Would you say on the right, on the VD, you can also see a, um, the pleural effusion quarterly on the right side? It's not as sharp there in that corner? Good point, good point. And this is, so the, we call that kind of rounding of the contour. So if you want to make, and it looks asymmetric. So good point, I, I, I I'll buy that. It looks less. Make sense? This is a clear separation. This is not so clear. But yes, I like that. The other thing that I would consider that may look like this, not being real effusion, is a little, a little bit of obliquity. Make sense? Oh, yeah. So that diaphragm, if it's you're perfectly positioned, then it should be very symmetrical. As soon as you start making it a little bit more oblique, then you need to tolerate a little bit of an asymmetry. So good point. I'm not sure which is the correct ex explanation for that. Yeah. Now, I think we've been through all the, all the abnormalities. It, do I have any brave person trying to put all of these together? So probably the first step is to separate this in two bags. One is the bag of the relevant findings and the other one is the probably not so relevant findings. If you want to do that, otherwise feel free to just give an explanation. Try to explain everything we mentioned. The, the challenge here is, is not to explain one finding, but to put one finding together with the rest of the findings. Make sense? Yeah. I would say it's near plastic until proven otherwise. And where, where do you want to look at? Where do you want to, where is it sitting? Where is it originating from? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it's meta, it's it's metastatic um, because I see a, a potential nodular pattern. Quarterly. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So I think we need to we need to now stop and go more in detail about that point. So, and I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree, but I'm gonna try to disagree with an argument. Okay. So, and I'm gonna take this one into consideration. And then I'm gonna to try to measure it. So that is one point, this is two, two millimeters. So my, my argument to think, to assume that that is likely superimposition Makes sense, there are multiple structures that are superimposed, including the ribs and probably a vessel that is crossing. I think that's my hypothesis. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's just superimposed over the ribs and because it's too radio opaque, it's too white. Like a nodule of that size should look like a vessel, like probably this is a vessel that has the same diameter, probably something like one, two millimeters. This is a lot more white compared to that. And actually, nodules, like less than three, three millimeters or actually more, five millimeters, they, are, they don't have enough tissue to generate a, a clear radiographic image. So if we go by size, we are under the size that we like to be. 
just because there's not enough tissue. And then adding to that argument, this is way too opaque, it's way too wide. If there would be a nodule that size, it should be just a little bit more gray compared to the surrounding lung, minimally, because there is not enough thickness to it. So I'm not so, I, I'm not, I, I have a hard time going through this case, assuming that the most important findings are nodules. So I will leave that to the side. I would not give too much relevance to that. I don't think they are. And their explanation is that, is the size and the opacity. And I'm more than happy to bring a little bit of an experiment that I did to explain this in more detail. So probably we'll do this after we finish with the case. So any other explanation, leaving the nodule situation out? And lung nodulation. Okay, okay. So which of the, all the findings that we can see can you explain with a lung lobe torsion? Um, well, you've got um, consolidation of the right middle lung lobe. Okay. Um, don't have any air bronchograms, um, which is unusual for such an acute sort of <clears throat> like aspiration. You normally see air bronchograms, which we're not seeing. Um, pleural effusion you can get with lung lobe torsions. Um, I guess it would potentially cause the bigger vessels on the other side because it's lost blood supply mm -hmm. to that side. Um, it, it, so you are putting most of the findings that you are describing are maybe present in, in lung lobe torsion. The pretty one that I don't like is that usually the lung lobe torsions, they don't look so homogeneously. Right. Why? There is going to be some kind of, you Crazy. can still see the, the airway probably going in the wrong direction or mm -hmm. a vesicular pattern. But the lung lobe could look enlarged or small. So in that sense, an enlarged lung lobe um, is, is, is a proper lung lobe, is abnormal in terms of opacity, there is a fusion. Probably the thing that we are missing is the rotation of the trachea, but the trachea is displaced. So mm -hmm. you are putting some good, good arguments there. Yeah. Now I want to, before we continue, I'm trying to put a, an argument or an explanation. This lung low, this abnormality, anyone, it seems that we are all assuming that it's lung. Can we, can we question that or can we find, can someone defend that? Why is that not pleural effusion? It looks like it's coming from the wall because it has a, a concave effect coming from the wall. So not, uh, I can't remember the actual description, but it's kind of, a concavity coming out from the actual wall instead of um, being um, concave, if that makes sense. Perfect. So, so we call that pleural sign or extra pleural sign. And basically, it's if you have a balloon and you put your hand inside, th that contour, which is going to be broad based towards the periphery, is what we call an extra pleural sign. So I, I like your argument. I like that you are thinking about that. I have a hard time seeing the contours of that, but yeah, so, but if you take this as a contour, so if it goes like that, that could, like this is, is broad based towards here. So that, that is one possibility. The, yeah, so it, it could be, actually it could be. I don't like it, but <laughs> I need to accept that. Your point is a very good point. So it, it could be. Any other argument in favor of the lung, against of the lung, or putting, I think that there are three options that we are dealing with. Is it the wall? Is it the lung? Or is it just accumulation of pleural fluid or pleural disease? So which one of these do you think is the most likely and why? The why is the most important uh, question. So we have an argument of, uh, talking about the wall. Anyone arguing, why can't this just be pleural effusion? Um, it's very com compartmentalized, and the heart, the little cardiac silhouette, is has a bit of a mass effect pushing it to the left. The I box. like that argument. I like that argument. Yeah. So, 
in the plural space, they, they, so by saying that I like the argument, what I'm saying is there could be localized, uh, trapped uh, situations where fluid in the plural space is trapped and doesn't move freely, and the classic case is going to be a pyothorax. So in that case, the, the distribution of the fluid is going to be uneven, and it can be it can act like a mass, so it can push things away. So. However, I like your comment that before that happens, I think it would be easier for that pleural effusion to extend cranially and caudally rather than going across. So I would use across makes sense, make, make creating a mass effect towards the left. So thinking about that, I think that I think that's a good argument to think that even though there is pleural effusion, because we can see pleural effusion, is likely not all pleural effusion. Another argument that I would use is that I don't see the contour of the right mid lung lobe. Makes sense? So that is the contour of the right caudal lung lobe. This is the contour of the right mid lung lobe. So either it's completely atelectatic, makes sense, and now we don't mm -hmm. see it because it's, it's silhouetting, or actually it's within that right mid lung lobe. And that is actually an argument to put it within the lung. Whatever. I, mean, I can't explain why the cardiac silhouette, I mean, why the trachea is just so raised. It's, I feel like fluid, can fluid really push the trachea up so dorsally? Like something's really pushing the current, like the mediastinum up. I, I completely agree. And I will put that together with the findings of the displacement of the heart. So, and I would call all of that mass effect. Makes sense? So, that white stuff there, which we don't see the contours very clearly, is acting like a mass. It's displacing things away. And it's displacing the trachea on one side, but it's also displacing the, the whole tracheal bifurcation and the, uh, the, and the heart towards the left. So I think now we are in a position where we can call that, even though we don't know exactly what, which type of, of lesion is that, we can call it that there is a mass effect uh, it's very likely within the lung, it's likely within the right middle lung lobe. For the arguments that we, we described before, we cannot see the contour of the right middle and then the distribution, where, where is it doing the mass effect? It's not going more, a lot caudally. So it's kind of center where the right middle lung lobe sits. So I think moving forward in, in trying to interpret, I think I, I would feel very comfortable to say there is a mass effect originating from the region of the right middle lung lobe with associated pleural effusion, okay? Yeah. The associated pleural effusion help us because it's the reason why we can't see contours. But only f fluid will not accumulate in this way. Make sense? Only fluid should go around all the lung lobes yeah. and in between lung lobes. And it should not produce such a clear mass effect on one particular level of the mediastinum unless we are dealing with a very weird pyothorax. I think that situation probably we should keep in the back of our minds, but I don't think it's the most likely situation. I would put this within the lung. It's, a, it's acting like a mass, so that lung lobe is clearly abnormal in size, it's enlarged, and it's displacing things away, and it's abnormal in opacity. Instead of being black, now it's white. So it's fluid filled, and it's enlarged. So. That is how I would deal with this. Let's go through your findings and try to um, see if we need to explain anything else. The loss of serosal detail in the abdomen, I would personally think that this is a young animal and that is the reason why there is loss of serosal detail in the abdomen. It's, it's poor, it's not completely gone. You can still see some contours and that with my eye would be a good enough reason to explain that loss of social detail, just because it's young. When you are dealing with situations like this, where it's a young animal, you already expect poor detail. But do I need to do any more if I just need it? So it's, it's hard to, you may miss a little bit of fluid and you need to deal with that. You know, that's life, you can deal. The other thing that I invite you to take a look in situations like this is to see the volume of that abdomen. Makes sense? So if there is lots of serosal detail, but then the abdomen is huge, then that it has to be more than just a puppy or a kitten. Makes sense? It has to be something else. 
and then you need to start thinking about fluid. So in other words, my inter subjective interpretation is that it's likely that there is no fluid, it's likely that it's just a young animal and it's a very young animal. So that would be my, my, my interpretation. Um, same thing for the um, physis, all, all of that belongs to a young animal. We talk about the trachea being displaced uh, to, together with the cardiac silhouette. We put that as a consequence of what is going on in the right middle lung lobe. We talk about the nodules. I'm going to come back to that because I, want, I don't want to sound like putting someone off and saying, oh, no, forget about it. I, I want to make clear that I give a reasonable explanation about why I believe those are not lung low, uh, nodules. We went through the pleural effusion. Uh, and then we are left with my, my comments about the vessels. I still believe they are big. One possible explanation is rotation. So the radiograph is slightly rotated. And then we see by doing that, we bring them, you know, they are a lot more clear than usual. And that may be a, a, a reason. Otherwise, we need to be thinking about like a left to right chant in order to explain, but it's just one lung low. So it's a very hard situation, like to explain um, enlargement of the arteries and the veins only affecting one lung low. If it's everywhere, then I would think about a left to right shunt. That could be a BSD, for example. But I don't see, I'm not convinced about that. And then clinically, there wasn't a murmur. So I think that's unlikely. And I don't see that in this, on this side. Um, a fistula in the lung could produce that. But again, they, now we are adding a very weird disease. So I don't know, I would end up describing that and saying, I think it's likely due to obliquity, but I would just make a comment about that. So probably the next step will be, what would you do next? Because even though we, or I, with my interpretation, I'm moving towards being a bit certain about this is in the lung, we're not 100% certain. So uh, what I would do next would be an ultrasound, try to figure, am I right? Am I right that is in the lung or, or not? And then I would use that ultrasound to, to put a needle and then to take a sample. Um, there is one more concern that I remember looking at the results for the first time that I, I had, and is that opacity that is almost within the trachea. So I don't know if that mass is compressing the trachea. The mass effect is so bad that there is compression and I don't want to say extension, but compression of the trachea. And that probably explains the severe clinical signs. Because if you think about how much of that mass is occupying the thorax, I would expect the animal to be dysmic or having some degree of difficulty, but not as much as it was um, reported. So I would be considering that the trachea is not only displaced, but it may be compressed. I would have that consideration. Um, do you want, Anna, do you want to tell us more? Or what you've done? Yeah, for sure. So um, I took over this case, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the cat was in an oxygen cage and um, virtually agonal when I took over. Um, the owners elected no further diagnostics and we euthanized her. Him, sorry, Mindy is very tricky name to remember the sex of. Mm. Um, uh, uh, post mortem, I ultrasounded the chest just to get a bit more understanding of what was going on there, and that mass effect was within the lung. Um, there was some kind of air still within the mass, so I could sort of say pretty definitively, even without the movement of the lung against the chest wall, that it was in the lung, um, and it seemed to be associated with the heart but because the heart wasn't beating and I couldn't look at obviously Doppler flow or anything through the lung or determine congestion or anything like that because it was post-mortem I've I, I felt like I couldn't say much other than there was a very consolidated or um, infiltrated lung lobe there 
So it wasn't cavitated. So it's not like an abscess. It wasn't like an abscess. No, it was really solid. Yeah, solid tissue with a little bit of air every now and again in our ways. Cool. I would have, based on age, I would have had like uh, an abscess as a top uh, differential, like put something in, in that lung more infectious uh, than anything, just considering the age. Mm. Can I can I ask Mariano on the Absolutely. lateral? Yeah. Can I? I'll just point out where I'm looking at. So anybody that wants to do this, when you're that top green bar that says you're viewing Mariano Macara's screen, and then to the right of that, there's view options. You can drop down that view options and annotate the images that we're sharing with everybody. Um, so if I just circle this part here. It almost looks like there's a density within an airway or something. Is there any chance that this is a complete bronchial obstruction or a large volume aspiration event or something like that? Yes, and that is exactly what I was mentioning at the end, that even if the trachea is displaced, it shouldn't have that opacity. So mm -hmm. another explanation would be there is just superimposition, makes sense. So it's some a tissue that is not within the trachea that is here and then the trachea is, is superimposed. Right, yeah. So, uh, so to answer that question, we need to come to the other projection and try mm -hmm. to identify here. But even here, it's hard. So I think this is the contour of the trachea that comes like that. This is the main bronchus to the left caudal, and this is the right. And it, there's probably some kind of line trying to be there. So, and that's why the hypothesis of this mass not only displacing but also compressing. I have a hard time seeing a mass invading. Makes sense? So I would so there is a difference of superimposition, one structure here, one here. There will be the situation where this structure is invading, makes sense? So it's kind of making that lumen narrow in that direction. And there's the third situation where this actually destroys the wall and goes in. I I have a hard time seeing the third option being such an aggressive, but it could be. That's why I'm more lacking the second option, which is it's just mass effect that it went so bad that now is compressing that airway. Yeah, I, I've never seen it, but um, never seen it in this, in this scenario with this mass in the lung, but probably that actually can explain the severe clinical signs. Again, if you think about how much of the thoracic cavity you occupy with a moderate effusion is going to be more than this. In other words, there's still a lot of lung available there for the animal to be so dysmic. So I like to add something else, makes sense? And that else could be a compression of the airway. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sorry. How, how to figure that out? probably ultrasonographically, if you have this nice window, and it seems that you, you saw that invasion, so that, that would fit perfectly. Um, another option in a situation like this, probably the ideal option, would be to, without sedation, without anything, you put the cut in a, in a, um, a plexiglass box with oxygen, and you scan this guy. And then you know, then, you, then this point that we are dealing with the superimposition of this mass with the trachea, is it superimposed? Is it invading? Which is hard to read in this case. CT is going to provide exactly that. Yeah. Um, I did aspirate this just for interest's sake and just got a whole heap of non-degenerate neutrophils and some what look like normal lung cells, which is disappointing. So now question aside, before I ask everyone if there's anything else that you want to discuss, can we take true cuts? post-mortem true cuts and then I mean my question is about the legality or you know how um, I always thought and I've been always pushing for that at the uni to do let's say cosmetic necropsies and then even even without doing an incision is in a case like this you probably just want a true cut with a true cut you know it takes one minute you take a sample you, you, you have CT and TrueCut would be phenomenal for this case. You you know almost everything you know. So 
is that something well probably we need to discuss in another <laughs> in another meeting but um i think the the um, the idea of doing cosmetic necropsies just triggering your question and not doing a whole necropsy is is an interesting one i would think that you need to get the owner's permission yeah for, for that for a, a tree cut because it can be seen whereas a needle aspirate no one will know you've done it mm. Technically, yeah. I think for, for an, even for a needle aspirate, you should have the owner's permission. But as I said, there's no evidence that it's been done. I I, I agree, uh, but my my idea there would be that I think an owner would be a lot more willing to accept a true cut rather than a necropsy. I think we'd all have to agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions about this case? Um, just in terms of the mass effect with like an aspiration event, would we expect there to be a mass effect? Because um, wouldn't it collapse the load rather than make it bigger? With the as uh, we are talking about if uh, if an ace. No, no, just in terms of like what's caused it we've okay. got like a, a right side in mass effect just in terms of like potential differentials yes like a, a big aspiration event completely occluding the lung lobes okay on the but would you expect that to cause an enlarged lung lobe or like anna was there a lot of pleural effusion was that pushing it like what what's causing the mass effect like because most of the differentials wouldn't necessarily make the lung bigger if you know okay, good good so i'm um, probably i went through that in my mind without making my thinking visible i think the differentials that i would consider are those that include like a mass so uh, granuloma um, abscess mm -hmm. neoplasia because it's acting like a mass mm -hmm. um, the differential of an aspiration pneumonia I would personally leave out. I don't expect aspiration pneumonia to change the shape of the low so badly and to displace the trachea and the mediastinum so mm -hmm. badly. Mm -hmm. in, in, in a situation of an aspiration pneumonia, that lung low, in my eyes, could include, increase size a bit, you know, compared to atelectasis. But basically, the shape of that low and probably the architecture in terms of the airway should be maintained. And this is breaking those two things. Mm -hmm. It's acting like a mass, and we don't see any of that airway. So I think I would use those two arguments to say, I don't think this is an, it could have been the beginning of an aspiration pneumonia that then it turned into an abscess. But now, now there is something else. Now there is something like it's acting like a mass and it's displacing things away. That would be my argument. To, to, not think about that option. The option of the lung lobe torsion is a bit different because that lung lobe could get enlarged. And it could get enlarged because of the continuous arterial flow mm -hmm. and then the congestion of that lung lobe. So it could be big. If I don't remember wrong, in the paper where they describe this, the lung lobe could be either small or large. What it doesn't fit is the opacity of that lung lobe. You know, I want it more, more vesicular pattern. It looks so homogeneously mm -hmm. soft tissue that I think that makes a lung low torsion l less likely. Okay, any, anything else? Okay, so do you, uh, I promise I'll bring the explanation of the, um, by the way, now this idea came to mind. If you like it, I was thinking that a way to keep this interaction alive through the week is to have some, some place where we can post comments. And for example, now the thing about the lung lows or the lung nodules, I would love to have a place where I could go and type the explanation of the nodules and you, we all can visit that. Make sense? So we can keep this like a forum. And I'm working on that. We see where we go. If 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 we don't get tired of these rounds after two weeks, I, I'm I'm thinking about doing that in the future. So we can keep this alive 
over the week make sense and we can continue the, the arguments or the discussions and we don't just limit to a one hour situation but probably what I will do now is I, I'll get that answer prepared for next time with because I have I've done an experiment with you will see and it's fun I usually use it with the students to explain this very clearly and I, I don't want again I don't want to anytime I disagree I want to have good arguments why I disagree I think a disagreement just because saying I don't like it is not acceptable so I'm, I'm very aware of that and I'm gonna prepare an, uh, uh, an explanation okay so let's move on to the next case um, which is called gravy I can post the link now and it's almost continuing with our abdomen we started last week and what is that we got last week um, there was that linear foreign body and we had a long discussion about it. I'll, I'll give you the history in this card. Uh, vomiting for two days um, I may have eaten a foreign body. It's a two-year-old cat. So I got, I hope you got the link. Mm. And probably, I don't know how, well, you got the images so you can manipulate them as you wish. I keep the three here for anyone if you want to annotate on them. There was a question about, can you do post-mortem CT of the thorax? Um, the answer is not only yes, but we just got a paper accepted about this this week. Like one of my residents at the uni, that was our project and the project was about what's the best pressure in the lung to bring it back to normal. Uh, and we did a study with multiple animals, different pressures, and we, we now know exactly what's the best pressure to make it look like normal, and it, and it does. So it comes back almost like normal. So to study the lung, uh, just because you can feel it with air, post-mortem CT is a very good tool. Underused in, in veterinary medicine, super used in human medicine. So it's, it's routinely used. Okay. Um, anyone, let, let's do the same thing. Let's go through findings. So young vomiting cat. You know, there's excellent contrast, so there must be a lot of fat there. Um, excellent point. And yep. uh, so it's a sudden onset, whatever it is. It's not a chronic disease. Good point. At least there is no fluid in the peritoneum. Yep. Is there um, subcutaneous emphysema in the DV? Yeah. Okay, can you point that out? Yeah, hang on. <laughs> um, in like this kind of area here. And okay. Kind of there, or is that just normal? <laughs> okay, anyone answering that question? Maybe it's fat. Yeah. And the, uh, the way to go about that, let me bring that thing, is to compare that with that and with that. Makes sense? So go to an area that you feel comfortable. Makes sense? This has to be fat. So they just folds? Like this? This is, this is, so radiographs is the only situation where you love fat, you know? <laughs> it's the only time in life where you, you know, having something fat, you, you just love it. It just gives the contrast. It's the same thing as having gas in the lung. So 
the, the problem with the radiographs is that there is a whole category of things that fall into the, what we call soft tissues. And we go usually very fast about this. It's an extremely important point. So, and what is not within that group is gas, metal, or fat. So anytime you play with these opacities, you see a lot. Anytime you deal with things within that group of soft tissues, you don't see anything. And so that's a very simple way to put it. So what we see here is actually the different layers of the abdominal wall. And you can even see the attachments like in each rib. So the detail is, is beautiful. Now, if you don't have what is in between, which is fat, you will not see anything. Make sense? So in the same way that air is providing that beautiful contrast to see even very small vessels, fat here is giving you beautiful contrast to see in between the different layers of the abdominal wall. Thank you. Good. I think it's interesting on the VD that the intestines are all on the right side. Okay, I love that comment. Even the colon, it's all on the right side. Mm -hmm. So another way of thinking about this, which you may not apply in this case, this may be an exception, but anytime you think about displacement, think about something pushing or something pulling. Make sense? In the yeah. case that we've seen before, we saw something pushing. Makes sense? There was something in the lung pushing the trachea. Uh, in some other cases, it's going to be pulling, but it's, it's kind of the same idea. Um, probably this is the exception to the rule. Anyway, it's a good finding. Any other finding? There's a gas pocket there, but it's probably stomach and it may not mean anything. But the wall around it is quite thick. He, is this, this what you are thinking about? Yes. And then this. Yes. And then, and then yeah. probably this. So it's kind of, I, I, I think it's the stomach. It's behaving uh, like stomach. In the left lateral projection, fluid is going to go more to the left to the fundus, and there's going to be more air in the pylorus and duodenum. And the opposite is also true in the right lateral projection. Now fluid goes more into the pylorus here, and it goes more in the fundus. The only comment that I would make is that it seems not severely, but a bit distended. Like a cat that it hasn't been eating a lot, I would expect the stomach to be a slightly more empty. But this is a small thing. Yeah. Nothing else? Uh, the small intestine looks very bunched up on the on all the views, really. Which one do you want me to magnify so you point out exactly what you are talking about? Uh, probably the right lateral, please. Okay. Yeah. Can you can you put an arrow or a line or an like there. <laughs> oh, that didn't work. I agree, Helen. Helen yeah. is just okay. So all of this looks I would call it different compared to this. Make sense? So this yeah. is a small intestinal yeah. loop. Yeah. Okay. And this looks different. I, I, and you probably, I'm gonna go the opposite of what the book says. So the book is gonna describe something with words. And then you're gonna say, this corresponds to that. I'm just showing you how a linear foreign body looks like. This is the mother of the linear foreign bodies. This is exactly how it looks like. Uh, then we can find the words. But this is exactly how it looks, that contour. Um, and now we have a normal ball loop. This is how it normally looks. Makes sense, it's more like flaccid. Um, if you would have gas in here, it would sit in this on center. Makes sense? It would sit there or there or there. In this situation, we have, for example, that, bow, that 
piece of uh, gas, little bit of gas, which is eccentric. Probably this is not the best. Let me see. Uh, this is probably not the best example in terms of eccentric um, gas, but it's a beautiful case in terms of plication. And this is exactly what we mean by plication. Is everything is, seems to be bunched up, shortened, and with that irregular plicated contour. And this is just a beautiful example. And then this is what you should use to compare with. This is how it usually looks like. And this is how it looks like abnormally. So this is, a, um, I decided to bring this case because it's probably the, one of the most clear linear form bodies that I've seen. So look at this, look at that application. And let's see if we have any external or peripheral gas, triangular, um, probably not too much. And now we come back to the comment, original comment about all the bowel seems to be in the right side. So that what is what we call kind of clamping. So everything is clamped together, is forming like a mass of bowel. Um, there is kind of shortening just because of application. It looks like there is not enough bowel there. There is kind of less. It's just all clamped together. And then we have the application, and then we have the peripheral triangular gas opacities. Those are the features. If you want to take on your uh, eye cameras and memorize how a linear form model looks like, this is a good example. This is exactly how it looks. Usually it's not that obvious. So usually this is a very long one. I would say, I don't know, it seems like almost 80% of the small intestine is affected. Usually it's not like that. Usually it's a lot less. So you may find more normal and you may have the hint of a linear foreign body in just one corner or just two or three bowel loops that they look abnormal. This is almost all small bowel. I, I have a hard time identifying normal. It is probably the only normal that I see. All the rest is all has the features of plication and clamping together. Could you point out the triangles that you mentioned? Oh, there? no, this is this is not helping me with that triangles, but I'll, I'll find another case where there are more triangles. The yeah. idea is that if you, if you bring the bowel like, and you make it short and you have that plication, the gas is gonna sit in those pouches. And then sometimes it's very useful. In this case, I think the most useful thing is this, that plication, that, that contour. That one, that one, that one. And this is a confirmed case. I sent it to surgery and then it was obviously a from body. Um, one point that I wanted to make, continuing our, our discussion from last week about the features that we use for mechanical ileus and foreign bodies and if there is distension or no distension, if it's at the end of the, like in the ileum with the corn cup that we've seen last time or in the duodenum, how all the, these uh, exceptions to the rule this is somehow an except, exception to the rule because it's obstructed, but it's not distended. Make sense? So this is an exception to a rule where if we just tune when we want to rule out a foreign body for distension of the bowel loop, sometimes we see it if it's distal in the bowel loop, but this is usually with a linear foreign body attached to the tongue that goes all the way to the stomach and all the way to the bowel. So it's usually without associated distension of the bowel which is what we usually, we are always trying to find. So this is another little bit of an exception to the rule. It has very characteristic findings, which this is a great example for. Okay, do you have any questions about this? It's hard to find the perfect case. This is a 95% case. It has everything except those triangular gas opacities. Uh, sometimes you get the triangular gas opacities, uh, you don't get the application that nice, um, or it's not as severe. Any questions?
No. So, um, probably one more comment is to the group, to encourage the group to send us your own cases. Um, and then I'm, I'm happy finding cases. I, I, I love saving cases and yeah. But it, this is also a forum for you to bring your own cases and, and to have someone else looking at them and to discuss them. Okay. You are all very quiet today. We are missing. We are missing Paul, with his uh, always being, uh, dis we always disagreeing. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of a describe these. Like, I'm thinking sometimes they can be cloud shaped. That little bit of bow, and like overlapping circles. But that makes sense for linear foreign bodies. Can you say that again, again please? Oh, uh, like some of these little areas. Um, of the linear foreign body, the bow looks like they're overlapping circles. I like, agree. Or, or like cloud shapes. I'm trying to like imprint it on my brain. Perfect. I can see some uh, cloud. <laughs> that, 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 that is perfect because usually what happened, and the classic example is the, um, the lung patterns. We kind of go the other way. So we read the book and for some reason we get trapped in this alveolar pattern or bronchial pattern. And then we just, I can show you the, the mother of the alveolar pattern and you still are unhappy because you can't, you can't mentally fit what you make up from reading the book from what is in the image, make sense? And that, that conflict stays for so long. And then it's all about trying to fit your expectation of the alveolar pattern with what you see. What I'm trying to do here, and that's why I try not to use the descriptive words that we use usually, is to show you how it looks. This is how it looks, make sense? This is yeah. a beautiful example. I can give you another example with the triangular things, but this is how it looks. You find the way that you want to explain, the, the words that best fit in your brain. But the, the key thing is this. I would, if I need to teach someone linear form body is, this is normal, this is abnormal. The, you f then you find your explanation, find your words, find, uh, and the reason is there is peristalsis. So when there is peristalsis and the, so the peristalsis basically is gonna move the content of orally. Make sense? That's the idea of the peristalsis. If the content moves, perfect. If the content doesn't move, then the vowel climbs. Make sense? Something, that motion has to happen. It's very efficient. So either the content moves caudally, or if this can move caudally because it's attached somewhere, that's the condition of a linear foreign body, then this stays quiet or unmoved, unchanged, and then the, the peristalsis is gonna make the bowel climb. Make sense? It's gonna go and climb. And then there's gonna be a point where there is no more room. All the bowel now is clamped together. So that is the explanation. This is how it looks like. Words are separated from this. Makes sense? You find your, your best way in your brain to explain and to make, to, to explain how it looks. This is how it looks. Then if you are gonna see an example, the examiner wants you to say plication and words like this, because it means that you've read the book, but this is how it looks. This is a normal power loop. These are clamping together, shorter, irregular contours, plication. This is how it looks abnormally. Okay, so probably we are done for today. Um, again, invitation for you to send your cases. I'll do my best to post the cases at least Tuesday. Probably the best will be Monday night. So you have the Tuesday to go through them and you are more familiar. I'll do my best for that. Um, yeah, and then we meet next week. And in the future, probably we can have a forum where we can, if something, I love the situation where there are things unanswered that we keep having. So then this is gonna be the continuation for next time. We, we, like for example, for me, it's gonna be trying to explain the nodules. So that's gonna, that is something that I'm gonna bring next time. So if we can have that continuation, that, that is, is very good. Uh, all right, well, thanks everybody for coming. 
Uh, our next rounds will actually be me um, Friday at 1 p.m. at lunchtime. Uh, and we'll just be going through some blood tests, um, a bit of a kind of sort of linked approach to Liz's medicine talk on Monday uh, about hypo and hyperadrenocorticism. Um, I'll send out an invitation to that and some more details to the mailing list. But if anyone does want their individual emails on the mailing list so they're more likely to get the invites, um, just send them through to me. Um, the, it's Anna at northsidevetspecialists.com.au. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Cheers. Well, Thanks, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is, is Liz's talk going to be up to watch by any chance? Yeah, definitely. I'll put it on the app today. Awesome, legend. Thanks so much. Goodbye. No worries. Cheers. Bye.